Hey everybody, uh, welcome. This is the workshop uh, called Europe and North America, Lessons Learned from Recent Attacks in Belgium, France, Germany, and the United States of America. Um, the workshop is partnered with, um, it's a partnership with Konrad Adenauer Foundation uh, in Germany. I'm going to say about that. I'm going to say a few words about that later. First of all, though, um, the session is um, held in the memory of Professor Ewitsch Blinzak, and I'll uh, ask Professor Bernal to uh, uh, say a few words in his commemoration. Thank you, Asaf. Uh, I believe many in the room uh, knew uh, Eud, and for those who didn't, I want to uh, go over his uh, outstanding credentials in, uh, in counterterrorism. Um, Eud Prinzak, Professor Eud Prinzak, was an Israeli counterterrorism specialist and an expert on far-right Jewish groups uh, in Israel. He was a senior lecturer of political science at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where his research focused on terrorism, religious radicalism, and many other uh, aspects of political violence. Um, he had been an academic director of the Raoul Wallenberg, um, scholarship program, and after his fellowship at the Institute uh, of Peace in the United States, Prinzak founded and was the dean of the Lado School of Government here at the Interdisciplinary Center. He was the founding dean, and uh, I'm uh, happy to be his uh, successor in this regard. Eud uh, Sprinzak also uh, had been a visiting professor in the Department of Government in Georgetown University and the School of International Service in the American University. In 1992, Sprinzak was awarded the, Land the Landau uh, uh, Prize for the best political science uh, book. The book was The Ascendance of Israel Radical Right. He was one of the few experts in Israel on ultra-right uh, activities and ultra-right groups uh, who had told the Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin, that he might uh, face an assassination attempt. This is really something that uh, we all uh, are very sorry that the Prime Minister actually didn't listen uh, to the advice of Professor Sprinzer. Uh, he also wrote uh, Brother Against Brother, a very important book, uh, violence and Extremism in Israeli Politics from Altelena uh, up to the uh, Rabin assassination. And he was the co-editor of the Israeli uh, Democracy Under Stress. Elch Prinzak uh, received his uh, doctorate in political science from Yale University. And he uh, passed away in 2002 at the age of 62. Elch survived by his wife, Ricky, which is here with us and uh, four children and two grandchildren. On a personal note, I uh, am honored to say that Eud was my mentor. Eud was, was my uh, PhD instructor. And I find myself following his uh, footsteps in my uh, counterterrorism career. Uh, and uh, it's really uh, an extreme pleasure to be able to develop what Eud actually founded here at the Interdisciplinary Center at the School of Government and in many uh, research books and works that he have conducted uh, on counterterrorism. It is my privilege uh, to commemorate him uh, in, this, uh, in this conference and uh, may his memory be blessed. Thank you very much, uh, Boaz. Uh, Professor Sprinzak was also my teacher, and uh, his classes were unforgettable, and I keep his lecture notes to this very day. And uh, it's an honor for me to be here, uh, to be part of this school, which he helped uh, found. OK, um, I'm very, very excited about uh, uh, this uh, workshop today. Um, we have a really a fantastic panel, very international panel. And um, we have a large number of speakers today, so I'm going to keep my remarks very short because I would like to start uh, pretty soon. And I would also like to, of course, engage the audience in discussion. Um, 
what we're going to do is I'm going to ask the presenters to give a, a short statement, hopefully about 12 minutes, uh, certainly not more than 15, I would, I would ask. And um, of course, you know, this, uh, this workshop, as you all know, deals with a recent wave of attacks in Europe and North America. Um, you know, we don't have to go through the entire list. You know, we've heard all, we know Paris and Brussels attacks, Nice, uh, Germany, we had uh, Ansbach, uh, suicide bombings, we had uh, the train attacks in uh, Würzburg and other places. And of course, these recent attacks um, have been associated, many of them have been associated in some form uh, with the Islamic State. And uh, we know, of course, that the Islamic State um, has, since at least 2015, if not earlier, um, called upon uh, the Islamic State to step up its attacks. In early 2015, for example, the spokesman, the former spokesman, I should say, of the Islamic State, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, urged the group, uh, the group's supporters, supporters to target the crusaders uh, in their countries, wherever they are found. In May 2015, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of the Islamic State, made it explicit that the Islamic State supporters must choose between traveling to join the Islamic State or perpetrating terrorist attacks in their home countries. In 2016, IS, or Daesh, spokesman of Nani, <coughs> repeated his call and he said that the smallest, I, I quote him here, the smallest action you do in the heart of their land is dearer to us than the largest action by us and more effective and more damaging to them. In other words, he was calling upon the Islamic State, of course, to stage attacks in the home countries, uh, in, in Europe and in the United States. And these attacks, of course, have raised a number of important questions, which I'm sure we're going to address today uh, in the course of the, uh, the formal presentations and the discussion that will follow. Um, these questions, of course, relate to the, <coughs> the current strength and trajectory of the Islamic State, uh, the questions of whether the attack, the wave of attacks, including the Ramadan campaign of attacks we've seen, is that a result of the Islamic State's weakening, or is it something that, that the Islamic State has decided on earlier? We are going to talk about the question of whether these uh, new waves of attacks, do they represent a fundamentally new type of threat? Uh, we're going to, I'm sure we're going to touch upon the issue of single actors versus coordinated attacks. We're also going to look at some of the roots of this <coughs> phenomenon. We're going to look at the problem of radicalization in Europe and North America. We're going to talk about differences. Why is it that Europe seems to be at the epicenter uh, of these attacks? We're going to talk about some problems of uh, integration and questions of how do we, um, what are the, uh, uh, some of these causes um, and, and are we seeing this problem going on for, uh, for the long term. Uh, and of course we will examine oh, the, million, the million dollar question which is what can Western states do to stem the ongoing threat of jihadist um, terrorism. Um, I will introduce um, every speaker uh, one by one before he uh, steps uh, uh, to the podium. And we will start with uh, Dr. Michael Borchardt, who is the director of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation uh, in Israel, and uh, a great friend of uh, the IDC Herzliya, a wonderful partner um, with the ICT. We have co-sponsored many, many events, including a number of events um, that uh, where we have worked on issues, I think, in a very present way, like uh, governance and, and foreign fighters before they became really hot uh, topics. <coughs> Um, Dr. Borchardt is, um, he has an illustrious uh, career, he's a former speechwriter, for example, for uh, legendary Chancellor uh, Helmut Kohl. He has, a, he has studied political science, history, and public law at the University of Bonn. Uh, he's worked on the scientific staff of the German Federal Archives, and he's been at uh, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, I believe, since 2003. Right. And um, as I said, he's a valued friend, and we really appreciate um, the partnership we have with Konrad Adenauer Foundation, including um, their co-sponsorship of this uh, very workshop. So, yes. Thank you. Uh, I will do all what you call in uh, Yiddish schmoozing at the end, uh, of, uh, so keep the best for the end. Uh, but uh, first, uh, I feel a little bit emotionally urged to also say that uh, our thoughts are with Shimon Peres and his family. Uh, you know how much impact uh, this outstanding person also has in Germany and how important it is to acknowledge that I think a lot of people in Germany are right now <coughs> thinking of him. 
Before understanding what lessons can be learned from the recent attacks in Germany, uh, we need to undertake a little journey to the German psyche. Sounds a little bit hor horrifying, isn't it? Um, some three years ago, I would have started my statement with a somewhat cynic and maybe shocking opener. I would have stated that if I were an Islamist terrorist, what an awkward uh, imagination, uh, I probably would attack in Germany. Why? Well, I have the feeling that we had a very problematic mixture of two cultural attitudes. First, the more or less complete absence of a solid threat perception, some feeling of we are not so much in the focus and thus the possibility to achieve what terrorists always want to achieve, a funnel, a wave of shock, which has very deep impact uh, on every aspect of daily life. Secondly, and linked to that, I had, I had the feeling that we have a very fragile society, which does instead of standing together, torment to a certain extent itself with the question, who is responsible? You think I'm too harsh with my own people? Maybe that's a German habit, but uh, let me give you an example of what I mean. When the pilot of German wings steered his plan, uh, plane right into the mountain in the French Alps, the reactions were quite diverse. First, it was not easy in Germany to name this incident what it clearly was, not a suicide, but a murder of 150 people. Then there was a tormenting debate about who is guilty for the fact that this pilot did it. Lufthansa, the medics, his girlfriend, his parents, society. I'm not saying that this kind of investigation is not totally important, but compared to the fierce will in the United States, for instance, to stand united against terror, this intellectual kind of self butchering attitude might pose a problem. But before Mr. Gomez is starting to faint, uh, you might have noticed that I'm speaking in the past tense here. Uh, in regard to terror awareness, there is a significant change in Germany in the recent month. Recent statistics have shown that 76% of Germans fear another Islamist attack in the near future in Germany. Uh, this is an alarming increase compared to 59 in 2014, uh, after the emergence of uh, ISIS in Syria and Iraq. 41% already avoid big events or crowded places for fear of such attacks. Uh, natural disasters are still number one, but terrorism is the second issue uh, Germans are most afraid of. Nevertheless, 55%, uh, I don't know the numbers in Israel, but 55% have trust in our security systems of being able to protect them when it comes to terrorist attacks. We need to strengthen and restore the confidence in the security system of our country. We might also have to learn from Israel and Germany. And I know that this is a very difficult task, uh, uh, looking at the history of Germany, mm -hmm that we might have to sacrifice at least a little bit of our beloved privacy to gain more security, if we want this security system to be effective. The most encouraging answer was given in that regard, in all these polls, on the question, is the Islam the root of Islamist terrorism? Only 16% stated yes. So the basis of Islamophobia is still not very big, looking at the fact that it is one of the core businesses of uh, organizations like ISIS to raise exactly that Islamophobia in these countries in order to provoke the illusion of a clash of civilizations. This is rather good news. Has this dramatically raised terror awareness to do with refugee influx? Sure, of course. Definitely more than with the actual incidents. Is that fear justified? A big yes and maybe a small no. Just yesterday, uh, you heard about it, uh, three Syrian refugees have been taken into custody. Uh, the German police investigated against them for a couple of months. The logic, the logic of uh, ISIS is very obviously to raise the fear of attacks in Germany by using refugees for these attacks. I do not want to discuss the refugee crisis in Europe and in Germany in detail, maybe we do that later. I do not want to elaborate what mistakes might have been uh, done also in the political echelons. I also do not want to give maybe wrong ideas to ISIS, but coming back to my first sentence, one does not need to imagine what a major terror attack would mean in Germany in the course of the coming year. 
The coming year will be very sensitive simply because of the fact uh, that we will, as you might know, have federal elections in Germany next year. As we already have a growing amount of protest voters, right-wing populists with some strong extreme right fringes, a huge terror attack could have maybe severe political and electoral, also electoral implications. And it is not very difficult for a terrorist to figure exactly that out. This also means that the major parties in Germany need to be much more successful, uh, and this is being said by um, uh, by a person affiliated with uh, the Christian Democratic major party, um, I think that also the major parties in Germany need to be much more successful in addressing the worries of the people. Are the refugees indeed a danger? Most of them escaped religious fundamentalism and are thus not automatically receptive for radicalization. But, and here I think is the biggest danger, it is a simple fact that radical Islamists are currently trying to establish contacts with refugees in the refugee homes. They especially aim for the vulnerable, and this is not at least the unaccompanied minors uh, and young adults. There are more than 340, this is at least what the Verfassungsschutz in Germany is saying, more than 340 documented attempts of recruitment of these young people. But this, these are just the documented cases. Uh, as these attempts are extremely difficult to detect, uh, the, the true numbers might be much higher. The majority of the refugees are not only Muslims, they are Sunnis uh, and thus are specially receptive for the Salafist Sunni indoctrination. But I'm sure that we should also not forget that in that regard what I would call the home front in a country like Germany. I mean by that not the influx from the outside in form of refugees, but some terror outbreak and radicalization from the inside. I'm specifically speaking about the second and third generation immig uh, uh, immigrants and about the German converts. Uh, that's another very important uh, portion. Two, 2012, we uh, as the Adenauer Stiftung initiated an interesting study which we did for the German family minister uh, a study which I supervised personally. We used the empirical method of in-depth interviews and asked 40 Muslims in between 18 and 25 to talk to us. We did on purpose choose 20 that depicted themselves to be radicalists and fundamentalists. And we picked out 20 who saw themselves being moderates. All Germans born in Germany. Um, uh, after looking at the results, I have to tell you that I was not very afraid of the fundamentalists. This was a typical young adult's taboo-breaking behavior. I am Islam. A whole lot of hot air which would immediately come out if you just slightly prick them. I was much more concerned about the moderates. They were what one would call fairly well integrated, perfect German, good education, but yet in a severe identity crisis sitting between the, the, the German and the Turkish or whatever chair, being called the Turks in Germany and the Deutschländer in Turkey, having had some experiences of alienation, but the biggest problem was that the identity anchor, which was offered to them, was and is religion, and that there has been a rather mystic and unclear interpretation of Islam, total lack of theological knowledge. One could immediately sense if these people would come together with the wrong peers, there will be a significant danger of radicalization. When I came out of that room uh, where the uh, interviews took place, I was coming out and I was praying uh, to the Almighty, let us have a lot of religious instructions uh, in Germany. Religious instructions are crucial to prevent that. Looking at the role of imams, where do they come from? What do they know about Germany? What do they think about Germany? Uh, that's also very crucial. Programs preventing, uh, uh, preventing radicalization by language courses, religious courses, trauma therapy, all this must be promoted and extended. But most crucial seems to me not to underestimate the danger of Salafism in Germany as, so to say, the breeding grounds or the sympathy echelon uh, of uh, the terrorists. Salafism in the way it is in Germany is not just some backward form of religious thinking that it might be in the Middle East. 
No, this political Salafism, jihadist Salafism, in Germany has begun to become a radical expression, and this, I think, is the dangerous thing of youth culture. Being attractive for exactly the type of young people I just described. Currently, the Salafi movement in Germany is the Islamist movement, and I'm sure that Mr. Gomez is going to tell us something about that, that is growing the fastest of all. It's an estimate, at least in the so-called Verfassungsschutzbericht, of 7,500 7, people. This, this youth culture is addressing, uh, addressing young people of all social levels, all religions, all national and cultural backgrounds, and they are doing it the ISIS way, using social media for communication and propaganda in a very, very professional way, handing out the Quran right in the streets publicly, initiating also pop concert-like public mass conversions, Surveys and studies clearly show, and I think this is a very interesting thing, that those who are especially receptive for this youth culture are those who lost all their religious affiliations or roots, or have a religious affiliation but are totally illiterate when it comes to religion and theology. To me, this seems to be a very crucial point. I think our notion in regard to terrorism is to say, too much religion is, uh, is dangerous. I have the feeling that too much religion seems not exactly to be the problem. It might be too little awareness of our own religious roots, too little knowledge about religion, too little role of religion in daily life, religion as a matter of total private consideration. The numbers are not solid, but some 10,000 Germans convert to Islam each year, and of course the majority of them will live a very peaceful and decent life. But the fact that there is a significant amount of converts among those who lead the Salafi movement, like Sven Lau, Pierre Vogel, and others uh, who are the eminent figures at the head of this movement, the fact that there is a clear amount of those who actively try to commit acts of terror or support terror might have its reason also in the erosion of religious awareness in Germany and throughout Europe. I am sure that we cannot win this war of ideas and under the bottom line, what we are confronted with is also a war of ideas without acknowledging this fact. Let me say one sentence about Euro-Islam because Mr. Gilles de Kershove has in his wonderful and, and insightful presentations also that said that Euro-Islam might, might be of some help. I have to say that uh, this is the only thing in his presentation I strongly reject because I think no intellectual offer will win the hearts of those who are at the brink of being radicalized. I think it is much better to go to the heart of Islam and approach the moderates, the moderates we can find there, to discuss with imams who have respect in their respective community uh, that it is totally un-Islamic to commit suicide attacks. I think this is a much more winning approach than establishing something that in the end will be totally artificial. A last point I would like to stress is the importance of enhancing international cooperation. Uh, in order to address the increasing global networking of terrorism, of course we need to strengthen the security cooperation on national and international level. The existing security institutions such as Europol, Interpol, or the several cooperation platforms on EU level already ensure uh, a close cooperation, but needs to be standardized and routinized to create uh, even more synergy effects. Border control, that has been named before, arrest and delivery of suspects, um, the uh, interconnections of criminal records databases, the exchange of liaison of prosec uh, prosecutors. Uh, also, I think Mr. Gilles Le Cachot was quite right in saying that uh, the, uh, the prosecutor, the law enforcement, uh, and the uh, intelligence has to be brought closer together. Uh, these are just some uh, to be mentioned of the several feats of cooperation. But let me concentrate, uh, due to the fact that we are in Israel, uh, on one thing. Uh, in that regard, I think uh, a significant amount of relevant data uh, is coming from Israel to Europe that helps us to prevent attacks like in Germany, the alleged attack on a football match in Hanover recently, it seems to be crucial to me to invest a lot of efforts in trying to overcome the current difficulties between Europe and Israel. And to prevent, I said that before uh, in this university, what I would call 
Schadenfreude in German, which could be directly translated to malicious joy or gloating. And there is a clear feeling of Schadenfreude, I have to say, on both sides. In Israel, the Schadenfreude uh, facing terror seems to be now the naive Europeans wake up and cannot continue their shallow dreams of multicultural societies anymore. Now they will have more understanding for us and will learn the hard way what it is and what it means to live with the Muslim minority. On the European side, this schadenfreude is the Israelis are confronted with terror because they are unwilling to establish peace and to compromise for that. That's uh, a special mean uh, sentence because a sentence that implies that there is justified terror. But there is no justified terror. Terror is terror and has to be named as such. Both perceptions are not only wrong and inappropriate simplicistic. No, they are also dangerous and counterproductive. I can understand, and I really have to say that, uh, forgive me if I don't go into details, I can understand some bitterness in Israel about some moves on the European side. But I think facing terror, we are simply doomed, and I dare to use that word, that emotional word, we are doomed to cooperate. We are doomed to learn from each other. Let us not forget, those who are committing these atrocious acts, may it be in Israel or in Germany, have one thing in common. They divide the world in us and them. They had our way of living. They had our values. They had our sense of pluralism. They had our open societies. They hate our democracies. We are together in the bull's eye, Europe, the United States, and Israel, and not Israel and China. It will be our common challenge to find the right balance between preserving these values and liberties and guaranteeing the maximum security of our citizens, and that is a, a, a difficult task. But I think we will not invent any kind of convincing counter-narrative, and that is a crucial and important point. We will not succeed in monitoring social media and the communication channels of the terrorists. We will not prevent recruitment by terror groups if we do not do it together. On that happy note, let me congratulate ICT on this event uh, uh, and state that I'm extremely happy uh, to partner on this panel, which I think is exactly fostering this kind of exchange I was just uh, advocating for. Thank you. Toda Rabba. Thank you very much, uh, Michel, for your uh, very instructive and also very frank uh, uh, comments. Um, one of the ways in which I think about the problem of um, Salafism and Salafi jihadism is that it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's less an issue. I think the problem we're dealing with is, is um, less religion and it's, it's really religious ideology and that really right. um, connects to your point of, you know, they divide the world between us and them. Of course, the vast majority of, of, of Muslims are uh, not doing that, right? But, uh, but religious ideologists like uh, jihadists, that's exactly what they're doing. Um, okay, it's now my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, Paul uh, Cruikshank. Um, Paul is the uh, CNN terrorism analyst and also the uh, editor-in-chief of the CTC Sentinel, which is the flagship journal of uh, the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. Um, he's also the editor of Al-Qaeda, which is a five-volume collection um, of articles published uh, with Routledge in 2012. He's also the co-author of Agent Storm, My Life Inside Al-Qaeda and the CIA, which has been, uh, which is a great book on Al-Qaeda um, and, and has been optioned for a Hollywood movie, I understand. Um, Paul has degrees from uh, Cambridge University uh, and from uh, uh, SAIS, Johns Hopkins, and uh, he was also a fellow at the Center on Law and Security at NYU, uh, NYU Law School. Um, and recently, um, Paul has overseen the 100th issue of the CTC Sentinel. And um, coincidentally, Paul, I recently did some house cleaning. And um, you know, I was at West Point when we worked, when we started basically um, uh, working on the Sentinel. And I actually I found, uh, so I have a present for you. It's also your first trip to Israel, so I thought I'd give you a present. And I found the first issue of the Sentinel, um, actually a hard copy of it. Um, so that's for you. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, please, Paul. Do you want, you want to uh, speak from uh, the... Yeah, I, I mean, shall I just sit from here? What do you prefer? Whatever you yeah. Let me... Is this working? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my first visit here. 
Uh, it's been really wonderful. Uh, thanks for all your fantastic hospitality. Um, so um, I'm going to focus my ra remarks today on the ISIS campaign uh, to attack uh, Europe. And the, the current uh, threat picture is bleak, really bleak. Or to quote a phrase, uh, the system is blinking red. Uh, I was just at a high-level counterterrorism conference in Europe, and never has there been so much pessimism uh, about the, uh, the threat uh, trajectory. And the numbers really tell the story. Tens of thousands of European nationals and residents have become radicalized, with six to 9,000 uh, who have traveled to Syria and Iraq, uh, providing ISIS with many opportunities uh, to direct or inspire uh, attacks. Around 2,000 jihadis have returned, and those are just the ones European agencies know about. Uh, European security services do not have anywhere near the resources to deal uh, with uh, this challenge, nor are they cooperating and sharing information in any way uh, in the way they need to, given the scale of the threat. And as ISIS loses territory in Syria and Iraq, I think we should expect them to intensify attacks in Europe, with a focus being on European countries launching airstrikes against it uh, in Syria, in Iraq. And here we're talking about France, Belgium, the Netherlands, UK, Denmark, uh, as well as Germany, which, uh, of course, has been flying target reconnaissance flights uh, over uh, Syrian and Iraqi territory. Uh, I'm going to start by looking at the chronology a bit, and there are growing indications that at least part of the group was moving forward, uh, was moving towards international attack plotting before the coalition began its ad campaign in August 2014. In their most recent threat assessment, the Office for the National Coordinator for Counterterrorism and Security in the Netherlands stated that new intelligence shows that the leaders of ISIS have been ordering attacks on European soil since 2013 or have been involved in coordinated preparations to that end. The return of two French ISIS fighters in, to Europe in 2014 uh, signaled ISIS was likely moving into the international terrorism business. In January that year, Ibrahim Badina, a French Algerian ISIS fighter, returned to France and very soon afterwards began building several soda can bombs stuffed with TATP. Investigators believe he may have been planning to attack the Nice Carnival. While investigators have not yet conclusively established he was directed to launch an attack by ISIS, the fact he started building bombs so soon after arriving back in France suggests he came back with the intention uh, to attack. The second French fighter who came back was Mehdi Nemouche, a known associate of Paris attack coordinator Abdelhamid Abaoud, and one of those who had guarded Western hostages in Syria. In May 2014, Nemouche opened fire with a Kalashnikov at the Jewish Museum in Brussels, killing four people. Since his arrest, Nemush has been extremely uncooperative with investigators, making it difficult to establish the degree of ISIS direction uh, in his attack. But like Badina, he moved towards launching an attack soon after returning to Europe, in his case after a period of two months. His journey back to Europe was also extremely elaborate and expensive, involving stops in Malaysia, Singapore, and Bangkok, suggesting there was some kind of group that probably funded this, this, this roundabout trip uh, to minimize suspicion coming back to Europe. It seems, therefore, that ISIS was starting to get into the international terrorism business before the air campaign began against it. Their viscerally anti-Western ideology made it inevitable they were going to start attacking the West sooner or later. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi signaled this himself when months before ISIS took control of Mosul, he cryptically predicted that soon the West would be in confrontation with the group. Although there are some who are more pragmatic within ISIS and some who are more fanatical, there's a bring it on quality to the group's decision making in the belief God will steer them to victory. The belief is that there will be an end of days battle between uh, the Western Muslim forces and, 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 and uh, 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 in the Syrian town of Darbek is very much part of this East eschatological motivation. What is clear, clear is while they could have been doing a lot more uh, to provoke the West into confrontation before the summer of 2014, ne neither were they exactly trying to stop uh, their operatives from sending people back to launch uh, attack. Uh, there's no doubt, though, that the air campaign uh, that the uh, coalition launched resulted in ISIS accelerating uh, its international attack planning. The watershed moment was that long audio tape Abu Mohammed al-Adnani put out in September 2014, promising a wave of terror uh, against the West. And this, the group soon put in motion an ambitious plan to launch gun and bomb attacks in the heart of Europe. Uh, but Belgian security uh, services detected the plan and thwarted uh, the uh, attack by sending in commandos uh, to uh, a safe house in Verviers in eastern Belgium in January uh, 2015. Abdelhamid Abaoud had coordinated the plot from an apartment in Athens, 
Uh, the plotters had obtained Kalashnikovs, the materials to make TATP, and police uniforms, suggesting they may be trying to get access uh, to a sensitive site. We still don't know what exactly they were targeting. In the following months, we then saw a string of plots linked back to Abdelhamid Abaoud, Fabian Klein, and a cluster of francophone terrorist operatives in and around Raqqa, Syria. And by the way, it's from in and around Raqqa, Syria, that the CIA believe uh, that ISIS has been running its external uh, operations planning from. Uh, when I spoke to Director Brennan just a few weeks ago at CIA headquarters, uh, Langley, he said that that was the assessment of US intelligence services. All these cases um, also included an attempt uh, to plot a, an attack uh, against a church in Paris in April 2015, an attempt to shoot up a train traveling between Amsterdam and Paris in August 2015, and an aborted plot the same month to attack a rock concert in France. And from the interrogations of suspects and other intelligence, a picture of how ISIS put together these plots has formed. New European arrivals in Syria were almost immediately selected for operations, persuaded to participate, trained, and then sent back to launch attacks. The quick flash to bang meant that their time in Syria could be disguised uh, as a vacation to Turkey, making it less likely European intelligence services would suspect these individuals of terrorist activity. The Paris church plotter uh, back in April 2015, Sid Ahmed Glam, never actually crossed into Syria, but was instead directed to attack by French ISIS operatives he met in Istanbul and Gaziantep, ISIS doing external attack planning from Turkey. In the summer of 2015, ISIS took advantage of the migrant crisis to infiltrate operatives back into Europe by having them pose as refugees. This is how many and perhaps all of the attack team behind the Paris and Brussels attacks got back to Europe. The ruse meant that ISIS were able to send back hardened operatives who were already on the radar screen of European authorities. Unlike some, unlike some of those involved in earlier plots that had been quickly trained and dispatched, a good number of those that attacked Paris and Brussels were seasoned killers. A case in point was Mohamed Belkai, the Algerian operative who coordinated the Paris attacks from Brussels. He had previously commanded ISIS assault teams in Syria and Iraq. In the month before the Paris attacks, fragmentary intelligence came into European intelligence agencies, suggesting a plot was in the works to hit Europe. The intelligence indicated that the group's external operations supremo, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, had dispatched 60 operatives to hit five European cities, including Paris, London, <coughs> Berlin, as well as the city in Belgium. Recent investigations and interrogations have also pointed towards a broader plot last autumn, with indications, according to a senior European counterterrorism official, uh, that the Paris attack network were initially aiming to also attack the Netherlands, the Netherlands as well as a shopping area in Paris, a target Abaoud himself and another operative appear to have been aiming for when they were killed in a commando raid in Saint-Denis a few days after the Paris attacks. But buttressing the notion of a broader initial set of targets, it should be noted that ISIS kept at least a half dozen operatives in reserve in Brussels during the Paris attacks, several of which would later strike Brussels in an attack which was hastily arranged after authorities raided one of their safe houses in the city. Investigators believe their plan at the time was to attack the Euro 2016 soccer championship as well as other uh, targets. And also buttressing this idea of a wider plot against Europe, we saw those arrests uh, in Germany, three Syrians, ISIS operatives, uh, yesterday. Uh, they uh, are believed to have been part of a sleeper cell that were awaiting instructions uh, to launch an attack. They came through the Greek islands, arrived in Germany around the middle of November, perhaps a little bit towards the late uh, part of November of last year. Uh, but ISIS appears to have had to scale back the initial plans it hatched last autumn after some of its recruits failed uh, to reach their destinations in Europe. For example, two of those who traveled uh, with uh, the I uh, Iraqi ISIS operatives uh, who attacked the Stade de France were detained in Greece for several weeks because of suspicions over their Syrian passports, and they were arrested at a refugee shelter in Salzburg in December. The duo in question were Adel Haddadi, who is an Algerian, and Mohammed Usman, uh, who is a Pakistani. And their interrogation records form part of 90,000 pages of investigative documents obtained by CNN, which has shed huge light on the functioning of ISIS external operations division and how they moved recruits from Syria into Europe. And I was part of the CNN reporting team that broke the story last week. As CNN reported, the documents reveal ISIS has built up a significant capability inside Syria to launch attacks against Europe and that they've set up an intricate logistical support system uh, inside Europe as well to support those attacks. They show that senior ISIS figures are communicating via encrypted apps with operatives as they make their way back to launch attacks. 
Abu Ahmed, a shadowy ISIS operative in Syria, was the point man for Had Adi and Usman, the Salzburg duo. He recruited them to take part in the European plot and organize their training. As CNN reported, he acted like a puppet master from, a, from afar, handling their logistics, connecting them with smugglers and cars for transport, providing pre-programmed cell phones and getting them fake Syrian passports. He wired the money as they moved, using intermediaries who couldn't be traced. Throughout their journey, Abu Ahmed gave the men only enough money and information to get to the next stop, rarely if ever telling them what would happen next, the documents show. All her daddy knew, he told interrogators, was that they were being sent to France to do something for the good of God. It seems likely that ISIS coordinated the return travel of the rest of the Paris attack team in a similar way. Operatives were wired money and picked up from various locations in Central Europe and were driven to Belgium. Saleh Abdeslam played a key role in transporting these fighters to Belgium. The attackers congregated in at least three safe houses where they prepared their bombs and weapons before moving on to Paris the day before the attacks. Secure messaging platforms are essentially revolutionizing terrorist attack planning by allowing terrorists to plan and coordinate attacks in real time. For example, in the period before the Brussels attacks, the cell's bomb maker, Najim Lashrawi, appears to have consulted with a senior ISIS operative in Syria uh, to brainstorm about targeting, about other operational matters. Investigators in Belgium found a 16-minute audio, uh, audio recording uh, of uh, one of these sessions. Uh, which they'd actually uh, uh, recorded and they were able to listen in uh, to uh, some of, of the conversation. And with regard to these messaging platforms, uh, in that arrest, in, in, in those arrests in Germany uh, just yesterday, they also found pre-installed messaging apps on these uh, suspect cell phones. These were, these were Syrians. Um, and you'd think, well, sending Syrians back to Europe, uh, pretty difficult for them to kind of figure out to get from A to B to C. Well, they don't need to figure it out because they got their puppet masters back uh, in Raqqa, Syria, uh, uh, basically holding their hand every step of the way, communicating with them in, in real time, and they're going to various staging uh, posts, picking up money as they move forward uh, to launch uh, their attacks. I mean, this is a, a new form of terrorism, make no mistake about it. Um, ISIS has set up a significant logistical support structure in Europe uh, to underpin their terrorist campaign. Uh, dozens who assisted in the Paris and Brussels attacks are still believed to be at large. Senior ISIS operatives in Syria appear to have organized for these logisticians to supply assistance and weapons to plotters from afar. Uh, in the case of the Paris church plot in April 2015, ISIS operatives overseas appear to have been able to arrange for weapons uh, to be left in the car, which was left in a parking garage uh, for the attacker Sid Ahmed Glam uh, to pick up. It was uh, like out of a Jason Bourne uh, movie, the communications going back and forward. Information from interrogations of European ISIS operatives and other intelligence sources indicate the external operations division of ISIS is located within the ISIS security service, Amniat. One way to understand the Amniat, which is sometimes called Emni by European recruits, is as a kind of Praetorian guard within ISIS that deals with internal security, milita military security, counter-espionage, prisons, and external operations. The, expo the external operations branch is known as Amnal Karji and is responsible for running their international attack planning. A number of Francophone operatives appear to have taken on senior roles in the Amnal Karji, coordinating attack plotting, including Fabian Klein, as well as an operative known as Abu Suleiman. Intelligence officials I've spoken to caution against thinking of this terror bureaucracy as having neat organizational lines. The reality on the ground is of much more fluid um, uh, organizational uh, uh, structures uh, over there, and it, it appears that the group has been very ad hoc uh, in its uh, attack uh, planning. Uh, a German ISIS recruit, Harry Sarfo, for example, has spoken about being approached out of the blue by a group of masked ISIS operatives from Marseille and asked if he'd like to launch an attack against Germany. Several other times during his time in Syria, various other operatives put the same question to him. It didn't come across as a very organized effort. It's also worth pointing out that what has not so far uh, emerged from interrogation reports is any evidence the group is setting up training programs specifically tailored to launching attacks uh, in Europe, uh, like Al-Qaeda put in place before the 9-11 attacks in Afghanistan, um, and to a degree that like Al-Qaeda put together uh, in the tribal areas of Pakistan when it was launching all those plots against the United States and Europe in the years uh, after 9-11. Uh, that said, there are recruits coming back to Europe with the ability to make bombs out of TATP, for example, Ibrahim Boudina and Paris and Brussels bomb maker Najim Nashrawi, so they must be learning their skills somewhere in Syria, uh, but it's still not clear whether they're doing this as, as a result of being enrolled in a specifically tailored program like Al-Qaeda were putting together 
uh, to launch uh, these attacks. One of the Germans, a 17-year-old uh, who was arrested in northern Germany yesterday, only got a few weeks uh, of training in rapid Syria before he was dispatched to Europe to launch uh, an attack, and that was in handling explosives and weapons. They're not giving them a massive amount uh, of training. Um, let me finish uh, my, uh, the, the, the bit uh, the, 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 about talking about the, the sort of outlook uh, for the future. I think we're entering a dangerous period in which we're likely to see more ISIS-directed attacks. It may be a bit more difficult uh, for them to infiltrate operatives into Europe now because <coughs> ISIS has been pushed back away from the Turkish border in recent weeks. Border controls have tightened, and there have been a steep decline in migrant flows coming uh, through Turkey and into the Balkans thanks to a deal reached last year with Turkey. But ISIS's deep financial pockets, their continued territorial control of large areas of Syria and Iraq, and the sheer number of Europeans in their ranks means that they still have plenty of capability to attack Europe. Western intelligence agencies believe dozens of ISIS operatives are already on European soil, possibly preparing to attack. And the EU counterterrorism coordinator made a little bit of news just earlier today uh, by saying that he feared that they, 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 U uh, European intelligence agencies uh, were concerned that there were multiple ISIS sleeper cells now in Europe uh, uh, awaiting the right signal uh, to uh, attack. And if anti-ISIS forces manage to start an offensive against ISIS in Mosul this autumn, uh, I think we should note that there are external operations branches actually based all the way over in Raqqa. So they'll not be so much affected by that operation, and they may go into overdrive. It may be a very painful uh, autumn ahead of us in Europe. ISIS still has a lot left in its locker when it comes to international terrorism. Yesterday I spoke about how if they're five gears, perhaps they've reached gear two or three at the moment. Uh, and it's yet to dedicate anything but a fraction of its resources uh, to international attack planning and may not yet have set up a dedicated training program for international terrorism. The concern is that they can mount uh, attacks in Europe of greater scale and complexity uh, than they have so far uh, achieved. And there's also concern uh, that they might be able to launch attacks um, using unconventional weapons like rudimentary chemical weapons. They've already used uh, those kind of devices on the battlefields of Syria uh, and Iraq. I wish I could be mo much more optimistic, but this is a truly pessimistic time uh, when it comes to the terrorist threat uh, in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Um, next up, we have uh, our very own uh, Professor Boaz Ganot, uh, who doesn't really need much of an introduction. He's, the, of course, the founder and executive director uh, of the uh, ICT. He's the Ronald Lauder Chair for Counterterrorism and the Dean of the Lauder School of Government Diplomacy and Strategy uh, at the IDC Herzliya, and um, uh, is convening and supervising the 16th um, Annual Summit now. And uh, again, wonderful job. And um, I would just like to highlight, uh, among his many writings, um, uh, Professor Gnor's uh, book, The Counterterrorism Puzzle, which was published in 2005, is a, uh, a prominent textbook used in many courses uh, worldwide. And last year, he published uh, a new book called Global Alert, The Rationality of Modern Islamist Terrorism and the Challenge to the Liberal Democratic World, which has been published by Columbia University Press, and should, uh, all of you should read it. So, uh, Boaz, please. Thank you, Asaf. Uh, I'm privileged to have you as my colleague at ICT, and uh, we definitely contribute a lot uh, to the work that we do at the Interdisciplinary Center. Um, I would like to uh, refer to a few, uh, I would say, generic concepts that has to do with counterterrorism in general, and see how they connect to the subject matter that we discuss here uh, today, uh, which is the uh, lesson learned uh, from the attacks uh, in Europe uh, and in the other Western countries. Um, terrorism is a dynamic phenomenon. Terrorism changes. Terrorism evolves. That's what makes terrorism such an interesting subject matter for me as a scholar and for my colleagues, I believe, because whatever we know about terrorism today, it may be true for today, but I'm not so sure that it will be that uh, relevant uh, in a few years from now. 
Um, the terrorists are always trying to use new technologies, new modus operandi, uh, new uh, considerations that they take, uh, and therefore the challenge of countering that is a never-ending job, and one cannot uh, uh, lay back and say, okay, I understand the rationale, and now I know what to do about it. Understanding the rationale is a crucial uh, task, but it always has to be renewed because the rationale of the terrorists uh, is changing um, all the time. What can we learn from those uh, attacks that have been conducted, say, in the last uh, two years uh, in Europe? We can understand that terrorism is now more decentralized. It's not necessarily just the uh, organized terrorism that we used to know. We heard from Paul a, a brilliant uh, uh, description and an analysis on the threat of organized terrorism, and I just need to second what, uh, what he said on that, but I would add to that other types of uh, uh, terrorist attacks that needed to be taken under consideration, uh, inspiration attacks, lone wolf attacks, local independent networks attacks, we'll talk about that, we'll talk about it uh, in a moment. Uh, in the last two years, we see more organizations and networks which are involved in terrorist attacks in different parts of the world. We see different types of an attacks, more emphasis on uh, cold weapon uh, uh, attacks, and uh, a lot of inspiration on uh, individuals and, uh, and group. Um, we can, uh, uh, I would refer in my uh, presentation, uh, not just to the lesson learned, but also to the, the uh, radicalization process itself as it fits to different types of uh, perpetrators of attacks. I would refer to the messages uh, that uh, is being conveyed to uh, uh, potential terrorists and, um, and try to uh, break the code of the appeal of ISIS uh, for these uh, uh, different groups. And I would conclude with the question, okay, so what, uh, what Europe should uh, do, at least in my humble view, uh, about it. And I would, um, I would like to suggest the uh, classification of uh, three types of uh, perpetrators of attacks, or three types of terrorist attacks, if you wish. The first type is what I refer to as the personal initiative attack. This is the lone wolf attack. I used to give, uh, uh, as an example, Mahdi Namush uh, as, an, as a typical independent uh, uh, lone wolf, and when I say independent lone wolf, meaning a terrorist, a, a terrorist attacker that doesn't have operational ties with an organization. But after listening to Paul, I'm not so sure this is the best example for that. It still needs to be revealed uh, if this is uh, the good example. But uh, generically, let's uh, say that a personal initiative attack, a lone wolf attack, is an attack which is an inspiration by an individual that doesn't necessarily have operational ties with the organization in reference to this specific attack. It could be a terrorist uh, that uh, actually flew to Syria, have been trained in Syria, went back, but as in reference to the attack itself, didn't have a guidance, didn't have an order to conduct it. It was his own personal initiative attack, therefore it didn't have any operational ties in reference to this specific attack. Yet to be learned, because I understand that Mahdi Namush doesn't cooperate, we don't really know, uh, but uh, it's very important to analyze uh, and to distinguish between the, this independent lone wolf and what I would refer maybe as to an individual sleeper cell or a sleeper cell of one individual. Uh, it could be that one person have conducted an attack as a local cell of a terrorist organization. And, and from my point of view, it's, it's very interesting to learn about Mahdi and Amush, about others, because once we distinguish between those two modus operandi, we can learn a lot about prevention of those types of attacks. You definitely prevent those attacks differently if this is an independent lone wolf or a sleeper cell of one individual, and of course, how to mitigate it differently, and uh, um, what is the need to expose other in reference to that uh, specific attack that have been uh, conducted. The second uh, type of perpetrators, I refer to them as uh, the local initiative attack, or if you wish, the independent network. The independent network is, is quite similar to the independent lone wolf. Why? 
Because again, there is no organization that was operationally involved with the terrorist attack. Again, the perpetrators in most cases have been inspired by a terrorist organization. If you would ask them, by the way, they would say that they are referring to themselves as the activists of this or the other organization, but practically they are not. They, are, they do not have and they didn't have any operational ties with the terrorist organization. In many cases, when we talk about independent network like this one, you would find uh, uh, personal and definitely or, or mainly uh, family ties between uh, the perpetrators. I gave the example of San Bernardino, the husband and the wife, uh, and it could be uh, brothers, it could be cousins, uh, and so on and so forth. By the way, if you want an example in Israel, not recently, we had, uh, 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 actually quite recently, we had uh, an attack uh, in Tel Aviv, in Sarona, and uh, th there were two cousins that conducted this attack as a local independent network. They are not connected, not to Hamas, not to Palestinian Islamic Jihad, not, not, they've been inspired by Daesh, by ISIS, but still, they are a local independent uh, network. Those two types of attacks are totally different from the third type of the attacks. And the third type is the organized attack. The organized attack is an attack in which a terrorist organization is involved in one or all the stages of the terrorist attack. When I say the stages, I refer to the initiation of the attack, the planning of the attack, including recruitment and training and so on and so forth, the preparation of the attack, and the execution of the attack. So when you have a terrorist organization which is involved in all of those stages, or even in one of those stages, in reference to this specific attack, that should be regarded as an organized terrorist attack. I have good news and bad news at the same time to you when I compare the personal initiative attack, for example, to the organized attack. The good news is that in many cases, there are a few exceptions, of course, Nice was an exception in this regard, but uh, in most cases, the lone wolf attack are less lethal than organized attack. You have less casualties. It's usually the use of cold weapon. It could be uh, run over uh, using cars. It could be stabbing. It could be using ax or whatever, maybe even a, a, a light weapon. But you have a very limited number of casualties. That's the good news compared to the organized terrorism. The bad news is that we used to believe, and I'm talking in past terms, and I will explain why in a moment, we used to believe that the prevention of a lone wolf attack is an impossible mission because intelligence is almost helpless and uh, is not useful in, in this regard. Why? Because when we talk about intelligence in general, and intelligence in counterterrorism in particular, we are talking about monitoring a communication. One person is telling another person that a third person is going to conduct an attack or he's planning an attack or whatever. So you can use human, human sources intelligence, you can use comment, you can use uh, 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 communication intelligence by wiretapping and so on and so forth. And you learn that there is, a, there is an intention to conduct an attack. Once you know that, you know how to prevent it. That's the essence of, the, of, of uh, intelligence uh, in prevention of terrorism. But when you talk about lone wolf attack, independent, individual, the whole process of the initiation, planning, preparation, and execution of the attack starts and ends with the sick mind of one person. And until now, we don't have uh, intelligence capability to infiltrate to a sick mind of one person without any communication to others. I'm saying we used to believe that we are almost helpless in this regard because uh, when you analyze the wave of lone wolf attacks that we have ex uh, experienced, unfortunately, in Israel in the last two years, and we talked about it in the first two days, and when you analyze many of the attacks abroad, take, for example, the attack uh, uh, in which uh, the French police officer and his wife were killed, and, uh, and uh, the, the guy, the terrorist there, uh, uh, consulted his peers, uh, should he kill their children or not? What we see that in many of those occurrences and cases, we have a, comp a compensation to traditional intelligence, the traditional intelligence, the human and the common. What is the compensation? This is OSINT, open sources intelligence. And we actually see 
that the social network that we are always saying, and rightly so, that this is a very dangerous platform for the terrorists to use. On the other hand, social networks is also very useful to monitor the intentions of terrorists in general, but particularly the lone wolves and the local independent networks. I would like uh, uh, to share with you uh, my thoughts about the uh, um, process of the radicalization of those uh, uh, lone wolves in this regard. And of course, we're talking about the exposure to incitement and the propaganda. And I would like to suggest to differ between four uh, prototypes of, uh, of uh, um, lone wolf uh, uh, terrorists. Um, those uh, that are young adults, uh, and I would refer to each one of them in a moment, uh, that are being exposed to young adults' consideration in the radicalization process of themselves, those which are having specific personal traits and concerns, and I refer mainly to uh, people which are borderline, uh, psychologically borderline, or criminals in this regard, immigration, and I would follow uh, uh, Michael Bochard, uh, emphasis on the second generation of immigrants, and all of that I would elaborate on that in a moment, and uh, extreme, uh, those which are uh, uh, having extreme uh, religious goals and uh, concern. Those messages that are being conveyed in the overall propaganda to those four prototypes are being orchestrated. It's not just by coincidence, are being orchestrated by a terrorist organization. He is conveying those messages and the end of this process is people that are being, or individuals that are being radicalized. Those radicalized individuals might one day materialize this, the radicalism by the decision to conduct an inspiration attack, what we discussed before, the personal initiative attack or the local initiative attack without the involvement of the organization. But many of those radical uh, uh, individuals that have been radical, uh, radicalized in this process might find themselves um, interested in uh, supporting the terrorist organization either passively or actively. The passive support would be um, being engaged in what we refer to as media jihad, meaning they themselves start to create the new propaganda and incitement as the long arm of the organization that they support. This is how this media jihad, the social networks, those uh, internet sites, is being spread out uh, so much because people that want to support the organization, hesitant in being active, decides to do something which is more passive. The more passive way is either to uh, conduct or to be engaged in media jihad or to give monetary support uh, to the organization. The active involvement could be in one of the two ways. It has to do, first of all, with being recruited to the terrorist organization, in some cases joining the organization, getting training, traveling as foreign fighters to Syria and Iraq and becoming activists of the organization, and in other cases coming back and conduct the organized terrorist attacks uh, that we have uh, discussed also uh, before. Now, when we are talking about those four prototypes, I would like to, uh, to refer to the messages uh, that are being conveyed in the propaganda to those uh, uh, different uh, uh, prototypes and the considerations of those uh, uh, prototypes. First thing that needed to be taken under consideration, it was mentioned, I believe, in the uh, previous uh, uh, um, uh, session that, that we had uh, by uh, uh, the Kershov, uh, the radicalization process which occurs in the prison system itself. We see more and more People which have been, in, uh, uh, um, have been engaged in petit crime, they have been prosecuted, they have been brought to jail, and then they are being radicalized in the jail system itself. A lot can and should be done here in preventing this process. Young adults, when we talk about the young adults, we are talking about, in many cases, uh, introvert persons, uh, uh, people which are not that popular, uh, dependent in many cases, and they find 
in the engagement in the terrorist uh, activity, excitement, and sometimes even a way to provoke their provocation against the uh, uh, surrounding. Um, the third uh, um, uh, prototype, as we said, is the second generation immigrants, and uh, they are looking for the sense of uh, belonging, victory, belonging not to the uh, local state, belonging to the greater Uma in this, uh, in this respect. And the uh, religious extremists are fulfilling in what they believe a divine command and defensive war. Now, there is a common denominator in the message to all of those prototypes, and I would like to emphasize that. This is the sense of humiliation, or if you want a flip side, honor. Honor and humiliation. When we analyze the messages that are being conveyed to all those types of proto uh, uh, prototypes of uh, uh, the lone wolves and uh, uh, new recruitments, is you need to revenge for the humiliation. Which humiliation? Humiliation to your religion, humiliation to your nation, humiliation uh, to your family, humiliation to the women in your life, to your mother, to your sister, and whoever. The sense of humiliation is a very important uh, leverage that the terrorists are using in their, uh, in their messages. Now, let's talk about the first prototype. We have young adults here or young people here. Maybe you would uh, understand it more than people like me with the, gray, uh, uh, with the gray hair. I would like to argue that the terrorists, ISIS and others, actually broke the code of what really is the uh, uh, things that, that promote the initiation of young adults. When I'm looking at young adults, and I'm having young adults in my house, I see what they are interested in. Let's start with computer games, okay? So this is a computer game, uh, which is called uh, Grand Theft Auto, or GTA, in, uh, in, uh, in Israel. And you could see here, I asked my son actually to, uh, to bring me some of those uh, pictures from what they are playing in. This is mass killing, no lesser than that, of innocent civilians. It's not a battlefield situation. You are a criminal, and you run over people, and you shoot those people, and this creates a lot of excitement. I'm embarrassed to say that when I see them playing that, I also am very uh, 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 into the game. <laughs> it, it takes you there. The terrorists understand that. Now, let's talk about another thing, another, another hook of those young adults. And I'm talking about TV series. And I'm sure you are familiar with uh, some of those uh, uh, um, TV series. And uh, uh, Throne of uh, Crown of Game, of... Game of Crown, sorry. You see the swords there. You see the beheadings. When I saw this, I said, my god, this is ISIS. What are you talking about? This is the way ISIS behaves. Now the message is quite clear. Because if you look on the message that the terrorists are sending, they took the game Ground Theft Auto and they changed it in which, and they're not even shying out for the message, read it in their uh, in their uh, 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 words, your game, which are producing uh, from, uh, from you, we do the same action in the battlefield. Join us. The excitement would be there. The adrenaline would be there. Why to play with those nonsense? Where can we offer you to do it in real time and in real life? Let's move on to the second prototype the, the, uh, the uh, immigrants, and I definitely second what uh, uh, Mr. Bochard said here, the second generation immigrants. I wrote uh, an article about the differences between the first generation and the second generation. I did something which I don't have the time to, uh, uh, to analyze here. I did something which s seems to be weird. I compared 
the, the sociological processes that we have witnessed within the first and the second generation of the Palestinians after the 67 war uh, situation, those that have been before uh, Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza and, and, and knew what used to be before, and the kids that were born to a new situation and gave birth to the first intifada, 87, they were 20s, in, the, in their 20s. And I compare that to the differences between the first and the second generation of the Muslim immigrants to Europe. So I would refer only to this uh, latter uh, argument. Who is the first generation of the Muslim immigrants? And I refer to, not to the la uh, recent wave, waves uh, in the last two decades, if you wish. Those are people which are coming to Europe or came to Europe because of two reasons. Either they were looking for political asylum or they were looking to improve their socioeconomical status. That's it. If you would ask them what is the biggest achievement in their lives, is the fact that they got the ability and they were granted the citizenship of this specific country. This is something that they dream all their life. And yes, when they traveled there, they, uh, they had uh, uh, very low income jobs there, blue ribbon, uh, uh, blue color type of, uh, of jobs. They didn't feel uh, very cozy there. They were not integrated. That's all true. But they always remember what they left back home. And they have still friends and family that they can consult and tell them, you think you live uh, a, a difficult life? Just look what is in our homeland happening right now. And they are practically satisfied with the situation. The second generation of the immigrants are born to a new different ballgame. Nobody gave them any favor by granting them the citizenship of this or the other country. Actually, they are frustrated because when they look around on their peers, they believe, and in most cases rightly so, that they are second-class citizens. They do not have the same opportunity. They are not integrated. They are literate in the language. They are much more educated in many cases uh, compared to the uh, parents, but they have an identity crisis. Who are we? Are we Algerians? Are we Moroccans? Are we Syrians? Are we French? Are we Spanish? And so on and so forth have a totally different system value, <coughs> value system. And this creates something that we saw, by the way, in the first intifada in Israel as well, generation crisis within the family itself, the breakdown of the figure father, because they despise their parents. They do not understand that they are second class citizens and they are happy with the situation. They cannot figure out how it happens. And therefore, you could see in many of those homegrown terrorists that are traveling to Syria, and Iraq, that this is against the will of their parents. And, uh, and they do not like this idea. Some of them even try to travel themselves to Syria to save them. All of this is being orchestrated by a terrorist organized organization that want to inspire those people, give them those uh, 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 alternative value systems and recruit them uh, to be active in the mission. When we talk about the jail system, I don't want to elaborate on that, but you could see that in the last uh, two years, many, I would even dare to say most of the individuals that conducted the inspiration attacks in Europe spent before that time in jail, and therefore the jail system have been uh, served as a platform for radicalization. I can tell you that here at ICT, we have conducted 15 years ago a workshop in Elat with the heads of the prison systems in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, and other places. And we warned from that specific process. Our recommendation was separation. You should separate those that might inspire others, those that has this uh, ability, religious capability, to radicalize youngsters in the jail system. Those that are members of terrorist organization, you should separate them from others. And they said, no, 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 we cannot separate. This is against our internal laws. We cannot separate in the jail system. That's the outcome. As for the, uh, uh, the, the concept of humiliation and revenge, those are pictures of four lone wolves 
that have been captured immediately after stabbing in the Israeli streets in the last six months. And you can see the common denominator on the face. The smile, the vicious smile, the smile which in my view is a satisfaction smile because they believe that they revenge for this humiliation, the other humiliation. By the way, many of those are provoking not just against Israel. They are provoking against the Palestinian Authority and they're provoking against the terrorist organizations themselves. They wrote in the social networks that don't take responsibility, Hamas, Palestinians, don't take responsibility of this attack because we don't identify with you. This is our way to revenge and to send our specific message. To conclude, what, is, what should be the lesson learned uh, from, that, from that process? Everybody is talking about the immigration, the huge immigration uh, to Europe, and, and, and uh, we are very concerned with things that have been dis described here in other panels. Uh, those immigrants that are being used will be used in order to provoke terrorist attacks, organized attacks that will be orchestrated from El Raqqa, from Syria, and from other places. One should not underestimate the threat, but this is the immediate threat. And the, uh, I also share the belief that uh, we would see more than that, and we would see more severe attacks. You know that tomorrow we are going to have this uh, simulation about a potential chemical attack in a European country, uh, because we tend to believe that this is a concrete uh, threat in Europe, uh, but this is the organized attacks. I think that uh, uh, one should take under consideration that the hundreds of thousands or millions which are now traveling as new immigrants to Europe, what would be the implications of those people in reference to conducting terrorist attacks? Not today, not in the coming even five years, when the second generation of those people which uh, would become young adults this would be another challenge to, uh, to Europe. Um, when we talk about prevention of those attacks, we need to remember that prevention is based on a chain of security. And the chain of security is very fragile. The strength of the chain of security is as strong as the weakest link of the chain. If Belgium has a problem in the intelligence, in the ability to monitor uh, the radical people in uh, Belgium, the problem is not a Belgium problem. It's a problem of France, it's a problem of Germany, it's a problem of Spain, it's a problem of all neighboring countries and vice versa, by the way. Mahdi Namush uh, uh, conducted the attack in Brussels, but he's a Frenchman. And he was smart enough, by the way, to travel from Paris and to attack in <coughs> Brussels because he wanted not, uh, he was afraid that he would be under the radar of the intelligence services in France. And he was right because he was under the uh, 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 radar of the French intelligence. So he decided to attack in Brussels and go back. This was a smart move from his point of view. The Europeans should understand that they have, in my view, two options. Either to go back from the Schengen Agreement, which would not happen, I know, but either to build, not border control, borders. How can you build border control if there is no borders? So either they would create the borders again and have much better border controls. And as said before, I don't think it would happen in the near future. Or, and this is the alternative, refer to Europe as one unified territory in reference to security. Don't rely on the local, just on the local capability of this state or the other state, because if one leak will break, the whole chain would be open. Meaning, stop talking about better inter-European cooperation. That's good, but not good enough. Move from international cooperation or inter-European cooperation into joint counter-terrorism efforts, when I'm saying joint counterterrorism effort, I'm talking about joint apparatuses and joint doctrine and joint capabilities. And it can be done. There are many difficulties. I'm not underestimating the difficulties, especially when we talk about fragile intelligence. Nobody is, is really uh, uh, interested in sharing this uh, fragile intelligence with other countries, even if those are very friendly countries in the same EU. 
But when I talk about OSINT, for example, why should, uh, why should we spend money and effort in building OSINT monitoring capabilities in Belgium, in France, in, in Germany, and so on? It could be unified and should be unified. Monitoring the, uh, those which are the, the returnees should be unified. You know what? Even, I'm talking about even operational apparatuses, and I would conclude with that. Take, for example, just as an example, the task of negotiation in hostage barricade situations. This is uh, a profession. You have professionals all over the world, including in Europe, that can and that their job to negotiate with terrorists that are taking hostages. The whole doctrine of negotiation with terrorists was based, I'm talking past terms, was based on one concept. You're a good negotiator if you can persuade the hostage taker not to hurt the hostages and hopefully even to free them, and in return, you guarantee his own life. There is no meaning of that anymore. Because the hostage takers of today doesn't want to live. They doesn't want to end the crisis and the attack when they are living. They are taking hostages for many, many reasons. I won't get into it. But at the end of the day, they want to die. So you need to change the whole doctrine, the whole messages. You can do that. And why should you need a hostage uh, uh, team, a negotiation team in, in France and in Germany and so on and so forth? You need a local force, no doubt about it. But you can have one European negotiation team that will be trained for that. And it can be fl fly in in no time. This is changing the disk. This is moving from international cooperation in counterterrorism to joint counterterrorism efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Boaz. I suggest that we will take, uh, because we're uh, more than an hour and a half into it, we'll, we'll uh, take a 10 minute break, uh, grab some coffee, uh, use the restrooms, uh, and then we'll come back. I will continue uh, at 11.45 sharp. So be back here, because we have three more fantastic speakers coming up. And then we'll have a discussion. Brigadier General, of course, uh, retired Brigadier General, is our next speaker, uh, Russ Howard, uh, an old friend, uh, old personal friend, a friend of the center. Um, Brigadier General uh, Ross Howard is, um, uh, the first thing he says in his resume is that he's a rancher in uh, Pazo Robles, California. Um, but he's uh, obviously more well known for being a uh, uh, Special Forces uh, Commander for the U.S. Army. He's a senior fellow at the Joint Special Operations University in Tampa, Florida. Um, he's the founding director of the Jepson Center for Counterterrorism Studies at the Fletcher School where we first met. And then I talked to you into sending me a recommendation, which helped me get into the Can Combating Terrorism Center in West Point. Only That's a different uh, story. Behind um, speakers. And um, he was uh, the head of the Department of Social Sciences at West Point and also founded the, direct, uh, the Combating Terrorism Center at uh, West Point. We had a mini re reunion here today of the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. Um, he, his uh, previous Army positions, uh, there are too many to name. I'm just going to say that he was. Um, uh, chief of Staff. Okay, just so well, one one more word. He was a Chief of Staff Fellow at the Center for International Affairs at Harvard and uh, uh, Commander of the First Special Forces Group in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Russ, I'll stop here. Uh, do I have a... Oh yeah. yeah cool. So I'm a little concerned about my main card. You're seeing up here. I'm looking for. So in my country, the main card. Would
back there is two years ago at this conference, and the last time I did it was at a small university in Missouri, where I parachuted in, you know, to give a presentation, and I was going to catapult out in uniform, found out about 20 minutes before the speech that I had forgotten my paint. I mean, I really forgotten my uniform pink. <laughs> had all this stuff, right, on my doodads and all that, but I didn't have any pink. So we took the, the, the lecture <laughs> all the way back up to the, and I st stood there. Now the story I like to tell after three or four beers is that I was in my my boxer shorts. It's not true. I had Levi's on, but you know, I did this whole presentation, and they didn't let anybody come up on the stage so they could see me. The only other time I've ever Brian Jenkins talked me into buying a ranch. We had a long cab ride. He was telling me all what fun it was and all this stuff. So I turned 70 years old, didn't know what to do with myself, so I bought a ranch. <laughs> so I'm a rancher. The problem with that is conferences like this, and I have to thank you, Sauce, and Dr. Denor for inviting me. I used to direct stuff. Director of the Combat Terrorism Center, director of the Jetson Center, director of the small center at the Middlebury Institute. And when you're a director, you get invited to stuff. When it says director next to your name, whether you're short or soft or not, you get invited, right? And the young men want to pay your way, give you an honorarium, do all this. But when you direct something, you don't have time to go anywhere because you're directing, teaching, so you can't go on. So I stopped all that directing stuff, thinking that I could just go to all these conferences and do all the things I did. Well, you're not a director anymore, you don't get invited anywhere. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> so how else did it change my life? And you're going to be the recipient of what happened. So I gave a presentation on how to defeat ISIS. And I stood behind a lecture and I didn't use PowerPoint. I just Now, if you 
you've ever seen one of my presentations before, you know there are always a couple, three misspelled words in them. And if you find the first person to come up to me afterward and says how many and what they are, I buy all the beer for you the rest of the night. <laughs> you don't like beer? I'll buy wine. But you didn't feel free spirits. <laughs>
addition problem that we have today. So I think the good news is we're not puzzled by foreign fighters, but the foreign fighter experience is going to be different now than it was before. Much more so in Europe than in my country. I'm actually somewhat, um, I'm not as, as concerned about the United States as I am. Europe, you know, 200 is a manageable number. Uh, we come from locations we generally know, and I'm fairly convinced that uh, our intel folks, special ops folks and others, have this uh, understanding of the situation. In Europe, I don't know how they can understand every day. Today in Germany, we've, we've heard. So I'm more concerned in Europe than I am in the United States. Look at all the events in Europe, and then look at the Europe compared to the United States. And these, this is ISIS. These are not ISIS-directed events. These are ISIS-inspired events. And I'm not fully convinced that Orlando was even an ISIS-inspired uh, event. So I like pictures. Antiquities looting. Oh, did I skip? Uh, I'm going to fast forward. I might have stopped. Where do I go? Oh, ISIS out of Area 10. Okay, I'm sorry. Very briefly. We should not be, and others have said it most, much more eloquently than me, about out of Area 10. sharing intelligence, everybody has said that. Solutions include better law enforcement cooperation. It took me a long time to find the puzzles for this. <laughs> better networking. John Arkila from the Naval Postgraduate School, a good friend of mine, uh, just had a recent article in the San Francisco Chronicle, most of you have read. He actually contradicts Brian a little bit and says we're sort of losing the war. It's but he says uh, the, the way to win the war, so-called war, against ISIS is better networking, and that includes all of us. So the solutions, better networking, better police work. Where does the military fit into this? This is a puzzle, by the way. It's a Marine Special Ops puzzle, just in case you know, I was on theme here. I'm not a Marine. I'm an Army guy, but it was the only puzzle I could find. So, um, 
Thank you very much, Russ. Um, okay, our final speaker is uh, Clint Watts. Uh, he's a Robert Fox Fellow for the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia and a Senior Fellow at the Center for Cyber and Homeland Security at the George Washington University. Um, he is a, a consultant and previously served as a U.S. Army Infantry Officer, an FBI Special Agent on the Joint Terrorism Task Force and as the executive officer of the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, where we overlapped for perhaps a week or so before you left. Um, right, right. Oh, yeah, before I left. <laughs> before you. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, you know, you should all read his stuff. Um, I read it religiously. Um, it's fantastic, so great to have you here. Big thanks to Saf for getting me to Israel for the first time. I really appreciate it. And I think I had a presentation if you don't have it, I, I can, I can go without. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the Borough Solutions is a giant corporation consisting of me, and that's it. So, whenever you see that, that's just like my slide template I use for everything. So don't get too excited. Uh, we do good PowerPoint art, as you can tell. So uh, in, in terms of uh, Europe and North America, and, and kind of what I wanted to talk about today, is that uh, this, what I'll show you are some snapshots. I, every couple of years, I'll set up a, I do mostly structured analytics work for Intel analysis. And so this is kind of part five, uh, which is sort of the conclusion of what I've been doing all year because uh, I have no friends and hobbies. And I, so I spend a lot of time doing like data crunching and working on this stuff at FPRI and uh, George Washington University. And, and it goes back to our days at the Combating Terrorism Center. Um, and so what I would point out is, you know, when we talk about Europe and North America to start off, is that we should not be whining at all. Uh, in 2012, I flew to a European country, which I'll remain nameless, with a list and I had 56 names on it. And I said, these are 56 foreign fighters from your country that are in Syria right now. And we were tracking whether they had joined Nusra or the Islamic State. And they were like, where did you get this information from? And I said, we got on Twitter and we found them and then we wrote their names down. That was the advanced <laughs> intel work we had done. They thought this was outrageous, that we must have pulled it from something else. In a week, we had gone through, just picked up just the people that said, I am from country X, I am in Syria, and we wrote them down. And then we would track those over time. Within two weeks, we had built out a list of about 2,850 or so Europeans. This is fourth quarter of 2012. So 
we, sh we shouldn't be talking about why are we whining or why are we surprised or, you know, oh, can we believe this is happening? I think anybody who had seen those numbers would have known this would happen. Uh, Thomas Heghammer, who is somebody that we've, we've all worked with before, does great stuff on foreign fighters, and his estimate was always that about 10% of foreign fighters will return home and ultimately return to violence. And I think his number's exactly right. The problem is that 10% of a whole lot of people is a whole lot of attacks, and that's really what you're seeing today. I don't think these foreign fighters are committing any more violence than past waves. It's just that they're easily 15 times more uh, this go around than any mobilization before that. And so uh, a couple things I'm going to talk about. I, I've been writing a series of articles which build up to this one um, that I'm, I'll show you today. And I'm going to try and stay very focused to the European scene, but um, I basically use what was taught to me in 1992 uh, at West Point, which is intelligence preparation of the battlefield, but I just set my indicators off of social media and the work of people like Asaf, Paul, you know, people that are writing uh, on a daily basis, and that's where I come up with most of the data that I'll show you today. So the number one metric for any global terrorist group or mobilization is foreign fighters. If you're really a global terrorist group, you have to attract foreign fighter recruits. So if you want to know the strength of our, our resiliency uh, of a terrorist group like Al-Qaeda or the Mujahideen before it or the Islamic State after Al-Qaeda, you really have to look at what are the foreign fighters telling you and where are they coming from? So I take samples. I work with a bunch of our colleagues. We take samples. We build databases. And you'll see a lot of reporting out there that reports raw numbers of foreign fighters. And that reporting is mostly useless. The most important thing is the rate of foreign fighters per Sunni Muslim population. That's the most important thing to look for. And that's what we break down for. So when you look at these mobilizations over the time, this on the left is the Sinjar, or excuse me, on the right is the Sinjar records, which was last decade. Those are records captured in Sinjar, Iraq by special forces, and that had 563 foreign fighters, which was a sample. And so you could get sort of a sense of where the foreign fighters were coming from. And the big startling number from last decade wasn't Saudi Arabia, sure they produced the most, but it was North Africa. They showed up huge to Iraq last decade. If you look at the sample from the Islamic State, and I think Paul is one of the many journalists that have reported about uh, this foreign fighter batch, you, when you look at those records, not only is it a better sample, but you see two things that are different from past foreign fighter mobilizations. One, the Europeans showed up huge, much, much greater numbers than you saw 10 years ago. The other area that was of interest, which I did not pick up on until I ran the numbers, was Central Asia. There was a huge spike of Central Asian foreign fighters to Iraq this time, Iraq and Syria. And so when I look forward in terms of what should we look for, what, what should we think about for projections, not only is it ominous that we've had so many foreign fighters from Europe, for example, that have gone to the Islamic State, but we have that many that are still circling about. The next thing that I, I start to look at is just ranking those areas and trying to find out where the trends are. And if you, if you want to look at where the trends are, you can break out the rankings, and that's what the number is in blue. I mean, I'm just throwing a bunch of numbers at you, and you'll have to believe me. But uh, they're actually all published in an article that was at uh, War on the Rocks, if you want the data. And we actually uploaded the, my raw data there. If you ever need a copy of the foreign fighter records, I'll just give it to you. It's actually hosted at FPRI. But, what you find is that rate out in the far right-hand column is compared to 10 years ago. So in terms of the numbers, just from those samples, you're looking at a rate of about 500 more, 500 times that which we saw last day, decade for Europe. When you look at the Arabian Peninsula, it's an, actually not that alarming. They produced about the same percentage of foreign fighters they produced every decade since the 1980s. It's on par with what they've already done. North Africans are about on par with what they did last decade. So we see a lot of Libyans, Tunisians, folks that are showing up there. Tunisia would be the spiked group. They would be the one that's much above the trend line. But Libya is actually down. Why? Because you can stay at home in Libya and fight now. You don't all have to go. A lot of them have gone to the Islamic State, but not to the levels that we saw 10 years ago. Um, this is very hard to read, but I, I put this up there because if you want to look country by country or you're interested in your own uh, if you're European countries, you can actually go and it has all of the data from last decade and this decade and you can look at the rates for each of those countries. What's fascinating to me is I look for two things 
whenever I'm doing four and final sam fighter samples. One, what is the rate of recruitment per Sunni population? The second thing I look for is proportion of sample. So this shows the percentage of all that f those foreign fighter records that actually come from that country. And that's where the European ones are, are very interesting. If you look at the European countries up top, back in the Sinjar records, they were almost all at zero or a very low percentage. But they actually showed up in this one. If you, I have a full data set which has about 70 countries on it. You'll find that countries like Denmark, Belgium, and the Netherlands are far higher than even the UK, France, and Germany. The UK, France, and Germany all basically produce foreign fighters off that sample at roughly the same rate. Now, I would note that there were almost 1,000 records that were uncoded, and uh, Yassine, who was uh, on with me yesterday, he has been working with that data. Usually, if they hide their phone numbers during that time, it was oftentimes because they were European and they thought they might want to go back home. So the foreign fighters records, the most important piece of data in it is the telephone numbers that were listed in it. That tells you, you can figure out their area code based off of it, and you can at least guess at what country they might have been from, even if they were trying to hide what country they were from. So what happens is I make a crazy looking chart like this, which you can't read at all. I just wanted to hurt your eyes. But I know you're awake then if you're squinting, and, and this is getting late in the workshop. But what I do then is I essentially look at the affiliates. That's my next step. Because the affiliates are going to be important for what kind of violence are we going to see against Westerners moving forward. And I use 27 metrics to build out a table of affiliates to look at how the different ISIS affiliates might look over the horizon. And we've already seen a lot of them rise up. Libya is the one we've discussed a lot. Libya would be an incredible threat, right, to the European Union if they were to take on a lot of European foreign fighters. The European foreign fighters right now are trying to figure out where to go. And actually, the good news is their options are, are pretty limited. They can't travel to as many places that we, as we might think they would. Foreign fighters do well when they try and return to their own region, but when you try and return out of region, you stick out like a sore thumb. You can almost always find it. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I was in the Horn of Africa in 2007, 8. We would travel up to the Somali border and we would say, hey, fishermen, uh, have you seen any white guys on the beach? And they go, yeah. We'd be like, what beaches? And they would tell us. And we'd go, okay, so that's where the foreign fighters are at. There's no reason to be in South Somalia on the beach unless you're a foreign fighter. I, there's no way I could walk up there. So there, they, there are metrics that are out there that stick out. What this chart does, and I, I'm only trying to lead up to the European part, is it tells you where there are emerging affiliates that look better, the prospects look better for foreign fighters to return to, and then there's ones that are actually on the decline. Our traditional ones, which I call the, the old Al-Qaeda rivals, these are ISIS affiliates that are rivals, actually all look pretty bleak. They've all taken quite a beating. Sinai has taken a beating over the past year. Libya has really gone down quickly. Uh, Tunisia, Saudi Arabia, those countries, they're, they're basically on top of it. But the ones here in the center, which I call morphing, are places like Bangladesh. So this came out about two weeks before the Bangladesh estimate came out, um, or the Bangladesh attacks occurred. Algeria and the Caucasus, not so much. But places like Lebanon, I find extremely concerning. And that's one of the places I think a lot of the European foreign fighters can move to. I'm going to jump quickly to what I think is important for the Europe and North America context before I, I talk a little bit about lesson learned, which is choices. Foreign fighters have choices, and they don't all stay with the cause over time. The, the number one, the, you know, the best recruiter of a future foreign fighter is a former foreign fighter. Every wave, the Mujahideen, Al-Qaeda last decade, ISIS this decade has produced more foreign fighters. And when they return, the, some of them retire, but even in retirement, they still become a very powerful influence on recruiting the next generation. And so any way you cut it right now, while the Islamic State has wasted more foreign fighters than any previous mobilization before it, they've sent them off to die in droves, there's still going to be more foreign fighters that sit around in informal networks and informal networks, which will rally the base for the next generation. The question for Europeans, particularly in this case, and not for North Americans, are, are three things. Do you still believe in the cause? Are you still a believer in what's happening? Number two. Do you still want to fight? A lot of times foreign fighters go, they get their jihad on for a couple of years, but they don't really want to fight anymore. It's cool to tell stories about your two years in the army, oh, excuse me, in the jihad, 
It's the same whether you're a soldier or a jihadist. But you don't always want to keep up the fight. Some do, though. Then the last question is, can you return home? When you look at that breakout, and this is essentially what I'm doing right now for the paper that I got coming out in about three weeks, is what are your options and possibilities if you're Europeans? European countries have used different strategies legally. Some have banned them, said, taken away their passports, said they can't come home. Others have been taking them back home, and then we're going to monitor them. That's less popular now. And then there are other situations where it's like, I'm not even sure they're a citizen of my country to begin with, so they go into a float status or a visa status. So for a European country, I think the lesson learned is, can you figure out where your populations of foreign fighters are drifting back to and what are they going to do? Now, there are different roles when you return. Everybody thinks that you're a foreign fighter, you come back, you're going to be a fighter again. Not necessarily true. Let's say you still believe in the cause, you no longer want to fight. What do you become? You become a facilitator. And that's really what we've seen in the European case. I call it the iceberg theory of terrorist plots. If you see eight people perpetrate an attack like you do in Paris, you should look for at least three or four dozen people in an extended network that are the facilitators of that attack. So if we were doing an investigation in the FBI and we see three people execute some sort of plot, then we w I would normally assume there was going to be 12 others somewhere in the network that either have direct or indirect facilitation roles and support. You're seeing that happen now, as Paul was talking about with his great reporting, that every two to three weeks you're seeing two to three foreign fighters or facilitators being picked up in all these countries in Europe. So when you see a set of perpetrators eight deep in Paris and then another set of perpetrators six deep in Brussels, you're talking about 50 to 60 in the extended network that are active. Inactive, you're probably looking at another 50 to 60. So you have a significant problem there over the horizon. The question is, where is the next foreign fighter mobilization going to come where Europeans will want to join? Because this has got the grass roots now to actually facilitate on a scale far broader than we've ever seen in the past. The last thing that I kind of want to talk about is the Islamic State in Europe. And, and some of this I, I've, I've gotten pushback from, but there's really two parts of it. And I wrote it in, in two, uh, two stories. One. Uh, I heard a little bit right when these attacks were occurring that this is just how this is they're using the Al Qaeda model. I disagree with this. Al Qaeda was too smart for its own good. They they tried complex plots and they tried to make them far too intricate. They also recruit were always trying to recruit clean skins, if you remember. A clean skin European recruit, somebody who could go back in, would not touch off security, would not be under scrutiny. Uh, could execute an attack. And so what did they do? They recruited a lot of smart people who had no criminal backgrounds. And what's the problem with smart people with no criminal backgrounds? They don't have a lot of practice. And they have a conscience. And they think too hard. And when they get to the security checkpoint, they sweat. And they're nervous. And they, get, they make a lot of mistakes, believe it or not. So when you look at the FBI investigations, or even in Europe, a lot of times you see these plots were detected, and you're like, but they were brilliant masterminds, this, that, and the other. Sometimes it's great to have dumb guys, and that's what the Islamic State has done. If you look at who they've recruited, they are more criminal than pious. They've joined because they haven't gotten real deep in the religion. They join a lot for their friends. They join because they are globalization's losers. They're the ones on the, the, the downside of what, was, what has turned out to be a pretty great world. And so when you watch how they mobilize, it is oftentimes to your advantage to have a few criminals. I remember from my days as an infantry company commander, if you got a, a white recruit from the suburbs, he was almost always going to be worthless because he was too smart and didn't really want to get out there and get his hands dirty and never shot weapons before. I tell you what, there was nothing better than the homeless deer hunter from you know the middle of Indiana. Why? They had a criminal record. That's what brought them into the Army to begin with. They had no reservations about shooting things. They were not nervous. If you look at how the Islamic State recruits are, sure, they're dumber, but they have operational experience. They have fought together. They have now come back to Europe together. They have networked together. And while they are taking orders from the Islamic State, they also have tremendous autonomy. I talk about it in the article as commander's intent. They have shared experiences. They know how to operate. And even with just a little coordination back to the headquarters, they can pick out their targets on their own. We built a lot of our models after 9-11. This is a big lesson learned, I think, on terrorists will do reconnaissance. And that will be one of our first tip-offs to know that they're plotting an attack. 
These guys don't have to do reconnaissance. They are back in their own neighborhoods. They are hitting targets that they know well. If you look at the Paris attacks, there, there was not one place that those guys probably had not been multiple times. Omar Mateen, let's look at a North America example in, in North America. The bar that he shot up, he had been in dozens of times. There were no real preliminary indicators. They don't have that conscience. They're not worried about committing violence because they committed violence before they even went to Iraq and Syria. Now they're experienced and they have weapons. So they have autonomy in ways that Al-Qaeda never would have allowed and never could do. They never really recruited those people. The last thing is in terms of support networks and communication. Not only are they using encrypted apps, but they are rapidly figuring out other ways to communicate even when we shut them down. So social media, for example. Not only is it good for propaganda, but it's great for operational connections. You could see this with the Westgate attacks uh, in Kenya. They were using Twitter direct message to communicate back and forth. In a series of months, they can jump from one application to another. We're getting all upset about Telegram right now. In a year, we won't even be talking about Telegram. We'll be talking about something else. The proliferation of that communication technology uh, has given them an enormous ability to adapt and mobilize and repeat whatever attack they just did using a new communication platform. On the right-hand side is, is essentially the counterterrorism part of it, and it really comes down to capacity. As I talked about, in 2012, we knew there were going to be more foreign fighters coming back to Europe than they'd ever been seen before. But did we increase our counterterrorism capacity? No, we probably cut it, right? Because we defeated Al Qaeda. So we were like, ah, who cares? <laughs> That's what we were doing in the States. We were winding counterterrorism down right about the time that the Islamic State was rising. So just in terms of a number of recruits that are out there, there are far too many to track than you actually have in terms of capacity. Uh, the other part of it is a triage system. So we're just kind of getting to it in the United States, which is which are the actual people that you want to focus on? Can you build out scoring metrics? We have not done this yet in terms of research, but hopefully there's some great researchers out there who will do it. And uh, Seamus Hughes, uh, who's at George Washington University, I, I think they're the first ones on to it. We have enough cases now that we can actually figure out what are the indicators, what are the factors that go along with a case that's more serious versus less serious. If you're in law enforcement, especially with very restrictive privacy rules and with limited ability to go out and conduct investigations, your biggest thing is, I have 250 leads in my jurisdiction this month. Which of the five should I focus on? That's the question. I get one interview, one time with the subject for one hour, and I'm going to say what? Do you want to blow up America or England or France? And they'll go, oh, no, sir. I don't want to blow up America. And be like, OK, don't you do that. And then you walk away. <laughs> That's what an assessment is right now, right? Because we really don't know what indicators to really look for. The Boston bombing is a great example. The FBI interviewed him, but he was at a very early stage in his radicalization and development. So how do you pick out somebody who's maybe in their infancy and then try and anticipate what they might do two to three years down the line. The data is there, I believe, but the, the research has not been completed. Information sharing without investigative primacy is just called checking the box. So I hear a lot about information sharing. Everybody is into information sharing because no one's responsible for, for real, ultimately for information consumption. So we can share all we want, but what ends up happening, we did this in the US 10 years ago with information sharing, is we create a bunch of fusion centers who then fire the same report around to each other and say, I shared that information with you. And you said, if I could read all of that, I would need seven years to read what you sent me today, right? You can't possibly consume this. What it ultimately comes down to, can you take information sharing and put it with investigative authority and responsibility? And in Europe, that's an extreme challenge. Terrorists can move across borders much easier than counter-terrorists can move across borders in Europe. It's seamless for them. It's almost impossible in a lot of jurisdictions. The last part uh, of all of this that I want to talk about is speed. And I sort of mentioned it in my talk yesterday. All of this has happened at light speed compared to what we were looking at two years ago. So even to anticipate what's going to happen moving forward is going to be very, very difficult. There will obviously be some change in the communication space. I do think there are a lot of mobile uh, mobilize private companies that will figure out how to break encryption. It's a booming industry right now. If I had any money, I would invest in breaking encryption at this point because that will happen. But there will be some new innovation in communication which will help them in terms of propaganda and operations. 
Um, the last thing, and I'm, I'm going to skip right through this because uh, it was already hit, but using the spectrum of directed, networked, and inspired attacks, what's been fascinating to watch with the Islamic State is not only how they have combined all of those in their campaigns, but they have used one or another to actually enhance the, the other. And so I'd written a paper uh, about a year and a half ago after Hebdo, which is called Direct, Networked, and Inspired. And it's essentially, how do you use directed attacks to really ramp up networked and inspired attacks? And it becomes a contagion, essentially. How do you push that forward? And if you look at the Islamic State's campaign, uh, just in terms of the Ramadan campaign, when a group can build up enough of that capacity, this is how they can even impact Europe without even being in Europe. They can impact North America without having any recruits hardly. They've only got 200. I actually think the U.S. recruits to the Islamic State are at a lower rate than the U.S. recruits to al-Shabaab in Somalia seven years ago, if I looked at the numbers. But if you start to pair that out, and I'm hoping there's some brilliant data scientist out there that will take this on, you can actually look at what were the directed attacks they did, what were the networked attacks they did, either through affiliates or through their uh, formal and informal networks, and you'll almost see a two-week lag where you start to see inspired attacks. In any given moment, I would tell you there are at least two to three dozen people in the world that are pondering about whether or not they should do an inspired attack. Sometimes they hate their coworkers, or they don't like the school that they go to, and they're just looking for that last vehicle that can help push them over. In the case of the Islamic State, success breeds success. Al-Qaeda tried too hard. They didn't have enough successes to inspire people at, at a certain point. The Islamic State has, has really turned that on its head. The other thing the Islamic State has done, and especially in Europe and North America, is they've turned inspired attacks into successful attacks. If you look at the inspired plots of Al-Qaeda during the Aliki era, era, most of them were foiled or were very stupid. They didn't create tons of casualties. Uh, with the exception of Nadal Hassan, you did not see a lot of these going forward. Orlando in the U.S., San Bernardino in the U.S. has changed that, that rule, and that essentially that anybody can pull off a high casualty producing event, 100 people in Orlando. Amazing that one individual can do that. That's just one inspired attack. Al-Qaeda can never have even dreamed of doing that. Think back to the London bombings and the casualties we looked at compared to Orlando. One guy. So that's my uh, conclusion, um, and I, I'll sort of leave it with that. But thank you for having me, and Asaf, thanks for bringing me. All right, thank you very much. We have um, seven seconds left for uh, questions. <laughs> uh, can we take another 10 minutes, or wait, uh, or is No? Five? <laughs> okay, I'm going to shut up and see if uh, anybody in the audience has uh, uh, questions, yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, uh, uh, last night, uh, Paul Cartrand used the phrase hearts and minds. Those of us who are old enough to have either served or, in my case, covered Vietnam, remember that that comes from the phrase wham, winning hearts and minds, which is what the top military and the politicians use uh, in dealing with people in Vietnam. The grunts, the people in the field, were a bit more sanguine and less optimistic when they said, kill them all and let God sort them out. The CIA used the phrase, terminate with extreme prejudice. And we heard a more modern and literate version last yesterday or day before from Ayala Shakad, who referred to it as targeted assassination. We've heard you talk about the threat and recruiting, but my question is, when and if you get these guys, what do you do with them? Do you try to win their hearts and minds, which is probably questionable with true believers, or do you just um, you know, terminate with extreme prejudice? And my question is, do you or your governments have any third or fourth options to the first two? I don't want to take that. Uh they get a fair you hear me? Yeah. They get a fair trial. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, there's no other solution in a democratic uh, state uh, uh, based on uh, law. Uh, if they are being caught, and uh, we try to 
catch them, they get a trial. Clint? Yeah. I, so it's, it's hard for me to answer your question because I don't know if you're talking about Europe and North America or we're talking about Iraq right now because I see that as two very different things. If we're talking about Iraq, uh, my message would be you don't win hearts and minds and you rent them. So however long you want to rent the hearts and minds of, of, of a group, uh, it'll last about that long. We called it. Okay, so if it's Europe uh, or North America, and we're talking about people that we're picking up uh, or are returning, the, the most effective vehicle we have in terms of countering recruitment domestically in the U.S. or, or whether it's in Europe is defectors. Uh, and, and we've gone over this. I worked on, for 10 years, I worked on counter-narrative campaigns in one form or another. They were all a gigantic waste of time and very expensive. Um, if you want to look at what's effective, and I always use the example of the war on drugs or uh, smoking, what are the most effective commercials? It's a person who smoked and has the voice box or whatever. It's a proven marketing technique. If you want to look at um, groups that have done this well, Algeria did this well. They took defectors, they put them on television, and it really did hurt recruitment because you're hearing the alternative story. And you're starting to see the Europeans are doing this now. But my basic premise would be any of these foreign fighters that are coming out of Syria right now, if I was a European country, there are tons of them drift at drift in Turkey right now. They, they don't know whether to go home or try to go home, and they don't know where else to go. I would go to them and be like, here is your, your passport back into our country, but these are the things that you are going to do. One, you're going to give me your defector video, and you're going to tell me everything that was terrible about it. And two, you're going to go back into your community, and you're going to say, this is what the Islamic State did, face to face, not just over a video. Th that's how I would use it. If they don't want to participate in that, well, then it's detention, right? And they either get a fair trial or if you've revoked their citizenship, they can get a fair trial in a Middle Eastern country of their choice, right? <laughs> you present them those options, and I, I bet defections will go up. Now, I don't believe that you can rehabilitate everybody. I, I don't believe that at all. We, we can't rehabilitate criminals, so I don't know why we think we're going to rehabilitate jihadists. But we put some effort forth on it. Um, I think defectors are the best vehicle for, I'm more worried about stemming recruitment of the next wave, not of trying to fix those that are already badly damaged. And they've seen more violence than any foreign fighter wave before them. Michel? I, I don't, oh, it's on. I don't think that you, and I fully agree, you can't uh, fully rehabilitate them, you can't turn them around. Uh, I think we should uh, concentrate more on what I would call the sympathizers. Uh, if you look at the most successful terrorist group in, in Germany, that was the Red Army Fraction. And the Red Army Fraction died out that moment where the sympathizing echelons uh, have been uh, kind of pushed away or died out. And that was the moment where the terrorist organization as such died out. Uh, so I think this sympathizing echelons, n those who are not yet in Syria, but those who are thinking about whatever doing, uh, I think we should really concentrate on those, and, and there I said something in the, in the beginning, uh, to, to dream this dream of Euro-Islam or whatever, I think especially with the religious issues, we should try to reach their hearts if that ever is possible. Okay, uh, I'm going to be a rebel and uh, ask and, and get three more questions and then we're going to have to break because uh, lunch will be served. So why don't we get three questions and then everybody who would like to answer, uh, uh, the gentleman in the jacket uh, and then... Uh, Behind you, gentlemen in the, in the blue, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the red desk. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, just, uh, my name is uh, David Tukar, I'm coming from, uh, come from Villa Sangori. And uh, 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 you, Mr. Burkhar, Burkhar, uh, you said in the beginning that uh, uh, if you, uh, uh, if you had been uh, a nice terrorist, you would uh, uh, commit a nice uh, terror attack in Germany because of, particular, uh, because of particular reasons. But I say, if I were a nice terrorist, I would commit a, a terror attack in Warsaw, in Prague, or in Budapest, for example. Why? Because they are, uh, uh, these are big cities. Uh, these are on, in the European Union, and European soul. But these uh, cities and these countries are on the periphery, or the same periphery, the European Union. So they are not in the focus. And, uh, and in these countries, in the cities, uh, uh, would be a terror attack uh, very, very uh, surprising. 
So why don't uh, uh, the terrorists plan uh, uh, terror attacks in these cities? Why only in the uh, fragmented western cities? Okay, we have another question uh, by the, the gentleman in the back with the blue, sh blue jacket. One more question, yes, sir. No. Um, just a simple question. Everybody's talking about lack of people. Um, how do you force multiply using the average citizen? Uh, in Israel, for instance, the average citizen is involved through the military, in school first aid, situational awareness, etc. The United States, the average citizen, is somewhere circling around Saturn, and I'm, new, I'm sure it's the same way. So the question I ask the panel is how do you get the average citizen involved, whether it be in an active shooter situation or in an intelligence situation, how can you get them integrated into this process so you don't have you guys, which are limited, us guys, which are limited, and the fast on wash, which is out of the loop So why don't we maybe start from Clinton, we'll go through the panel, and whoever wants to answer any of the questions. I, I'll take the law enforcement kind of ones, maybe. So uh, the one thing that we've done is we set up all our models in law enforcement in the U.S., and I, I think it's very similar in, in Europe around what are suspicious activities associated with terrorism that we're going to pick off. And so we've done that for a long time. And a lot of those have proven ineffective or so low frequency that they don't render anything. In the U.S. example, so the Orlando shooter, or a lot of these workplace shootings, San Bernardino the same way. Um, part of the problem is in the U.S. we either want it to be terrorism or workplace shooter. For some reason we can't have it be both, and actually it is both. You know, part of their grievances, it is they don't like people they work with and maybe they have this jihadist bent. But the other part of it is there's a huge psychological component, especially to the U.S. recruits. They, they, a lot of these guys are, have mental illness in the States. If you're by yourself recruited from the Internet, you've given off no signals to your family and none to your community, it's probably because you're crazy. The reason they're alone is because they're weird. You know, and so our approach in counterterrorism in the U.S. has been, let's go talk to family members and they're going to tell us what their kids are doing about jihad. Well, teenagers are notorious for keeping things from their parents. We can't expect them to be the ones to detect it. Our, our best hope is on the internet, number one. I really think we have to figure out a way at a national level to use open source intelligence. I'm not talking about tapping into people's phones and Edward Snowden conspiracies, but there's plenty of information out there. We always go back on a CNN report and we see this person was nuts and was who knew three weeks ago he said he was going to kill a bunch of people on Twitter? You know, like we find that all the time. The other part of it is we have not, in our suspicious activity reporting system in the United States, really worked with the health and human services community. We've not worked with mental health professionals in a way that we can start to build a very protected way to get tips and indicators from them. We haven't done that well with law enforcement. That would be one of the bigger things I would look at. If you look at the Boston bomber, you look at Orlando, you look at a lot of these cases, we actually picked up on the tips that were terrorism-related tips, but we missed probably half the story with a lot of the psychological indicators that are out there, which would be psychological indicators that would match up with active shooters as well. The next thing I would tell you, and this is wildly unpopular in the United States, 
and being from Missouri, I will probably be shot on sight if I return back to the country, is I would enact gun ownership insurance. Here's why. One, it's crazy that we don't have some system to verify why a person can buy an M4 assault rifle, exactly what I carry in the 101st Airborne Division. We, we go around in the military and we train people for weeks before we even let them load a bullet into the weapon. But if I go to Walmart right now, I can just buy one and it's totally okay. It seems like a weird system. But the other part of it is the private sector is good at mobilizing these things. If someone wanted to buy a weapon or if I wanted to buy or a car, what would the insurance company do? They would say, ah, he's 18, he's vulnerable, he's got all these other indicators, I'm gonna do a background check on him. Those are all tips and indicators that law enforcement could use. Doesn't say that person can't buy a weapon, but if his insurance premium is $2,200 a month, guess what? He might be the guy who shows up at work one day and starts shooting people. There's a tremendous opportunity there for even the private sector to participate, to still protect gun ownership rights, and to put off tremendous amounts of indicators that also law enforcement could use. As law enforcement, I'd be like, give me everybody whose gun insurance is over 2,200 bucks. Guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna stop by and ask them if they've said death to America or if they wanna shoot a cop. That's it. But those sorts of measures, for some reason, we can't talk about policy like that. That's, I, yeah, the reason Omar Mateen can kill you know, shoot 100 people, and why is it he's as powerful as an ISIS cell in Europe is because it's so easy to execute one of those attacks. Yeah, I think Clint's absolutely correct about, it, it, whether it's a Columbine shooter or an ISIS-inspired shooter, most of these people are mentally unstable. But we are so politically correct in my country that, you know, you ought to be able to do on your driver's license, which says you have to wear glasses, that ought to be, you're a little bit nuts and you can't buy a weapon. But we, we, we just aren't at that level, we won't do that. So mentally unstable people are actually protected. But I think if, I think the common denominator in 90% of these is mental instability. I'd like to ask the fellow here that asked the question about what do you do, how do you get people motivated? You gotta have another 9-11. I mean, I hate to say that here, I hate to say that here, but after 9-11, I tell you, I, and Clint was in the CTC, I mean, we could go out after 9-11, not just in New York City or Washington, D.C., you could go out and talk to people like this audience, and I'd have you eaten out of the palm of my hand, no gimmicks, no, no jokes. You go around now, around the country, and talk about terrorism, you know, people don't know, not only don't they know where Iraq and Syria are, some of them don't even know where Canada is. It's embarrassing, and truthfully, it's embarrassing. But the population, I, I'm gonna put something out here which is not gonna be popular, but I want you to think about it. In Europe, now, I, look, I, I, I went to middle school in Europe, I graduated from high school in Europe, but I, I am not a European expert, okay? I travel in Europe every year. Europe has a problem, and it has to do with population. It's a demographic problem. Right now we're talking about short-term methodologies to convince um, those of the Muslim faith that, you know, that we can all work together. Consider this, and an Egyptian general told me this, so this is not Russ Howard going out. He said, you know, all this, this, this discussion about what's happening in Europe now, he said in 60 years it's not going to matter because the majority of voters in many European countries will be Muslim. And that is something that people don't want to discuss. So all of this we're talking about now, about Europe, in 60 years, I won't be here, right? But it, a lot's going to change, right? Mr. Corbis? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, particularly for the last uh, question. We didn't touch uh, the problem how to include uh, the general public into the fight uh, against uh, uh, terrorism. Uh, I think what we have to do um, as, uh, as states, as agencies, maybe not as agencies, but you know, we have to uh, include the public in uh, fighting uh, uh, terrorism. We have to find ways and means um, to uh, make the public responsible, feel responsible 
um, to uh, contribute uh, to, to uh, uh, be alert like uh, the Israeli public is. But unfortunately, of course, well, not unfortunately, fortunately enough, uh, Europe uh, missed a major uh, terror attack um, uh, to, to motivate uh, those uh, people. But uh, our um, minister, minister of uh, Interior, uh, he um, stated recently to the general public, um, uh, international terrorism will become one of the natural life risks in 21st century. So uh, there is not 100, the public uh, of course expect us to uh, prevent 100% um, uh, terror attacks, um, but uh, it will not be possible of course. But uh, to, to uh, contribute uh, in the fight of terrorism, you cannot only rely on, uh, on services and the police, you need the general public. Of course, Germany has a special problem uh, because of, uh, I don't know if everybody knows, Spitzel system, you know. Um, uh, we do, from GDR and uh, former times, uh, we do not want to come back, you know, to report uh, to suspicious uh, neighbors and whatever. We, it's, it's something in, uh, we, 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 I think we have uh, learned, but uh, still today I think um, we have to find a way to motivate the general public uh, to contribute to that. And second uh, message is, I think, uh, in countering terrorism, we have to tell the general public no fear against terror attacks. You know, it's uh, easier said than, uh, than being done. But if you see the figures and the risks of being a victim of a terrorist attack or victim of a car accident or victim of uh, having cancer, lung cancer because of, of cigarettes is by far uh, bigger, but of course nobody discussed these uh, problems. So I think to tell the people, you know, there is uh, risk, of course, uh, terror uh, attack risks and uh, we have to carry this uh, kind of risk. So two messages I think the government has to give. Uh, first of all, no fear. Secondly, please, if you find something, if you find a bag, if you find uh, a neighbor or whatever, please tell the authorities. Thank you. Um, I just want to sort of have a bit of a crystal ball here uh, when it comes to the sort of future evolution of the, uh, the terrorist threat uh, in Europe. And at the Combating Terrorism uh, Center, the, the cadets, uh, are taught uh, that there are three drivers of the Islamist terrorist threat. One is grievances, one is mobilization, and one is ideology. And with all three of those drivers, those components, I think there's uh, cause for concern uh, in Europe. On the grievances side, um, the, the Muslim population just has not become well uh, integrated. There's this problem, as some of our speakers today have spoken about, about the second and third uh, generation. There's a danger of a sort of Muslim permanent underclass um, uh, uh, coming into being uh, in Europe. They're overrepresented uh, in the prison population. There's now this extreme right uh, sort of backlash. Um, Muslims are the, the victims of, of, of targeting uh, by, by a sort of uh, surge in violence from these kind of groups. And of course, there are hundreds of thousands of young Sunnis that have come in from Syria and other countries as refugees who could be the target of radicalization by people already inside Europe. On the mobilization side, I think uh, it's going to be even more worrying because you are going to have all these returning foreign fighters who are trained killers, who are veterans, who have um, street cred, and who are going to mobilize more generations of, 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 of extremist fighters and operatives in the future. And on the ideological side, um, well, the caliphate really, uh, the, when they declared it, this so-called caliphate really electrified uh, a generation uh, of uh, radicals uh, inside uh, Europe. It was an absolute game changer that the belief that finally they got hold of some territory, God must be on their side. I think the only uh, the, the, the cause for optimism, though, is on this ideological side, uh, because when this so-called Islamic State is eventually defeated, they're pushed out of their territory uh, in places like Mosul uh, and Raqqa, uh, well, at that point, I think there's going to be a giant deflation uh, in this movement uh, in Europe. Uh, they perhaps won't feel so much anymore uh, that God is on the side 
uh, of this uh, project. But overall, I think a lot of worrying indicators for Europe. Just very quickly on the question about targeting uh, in Central Europe, uh, I think there is some concern about that because there are uh, some ISIS operatives floating around uh, Central Europe. There's some recent intelligence on that. But we need to listen to what ISIS um, uh, uh, itself uh, is saying about what, who they're going to target, and these are the countries uh, that have been involved in the anti-ISIS coalition that have been launching airstrikes uh, in Syria uh, and in Iraq. I think those are the, the countries where you're going to have much higher risks uh, of uh, uh, attacks, and ISIS is also more likely to launch attacks in countries with larger Muslim populations uh, because what they're trying to do is quote-unquote shrink the gray zone. They're trying to provoke an extreme right reaction in Europe against the Muslim community so that they can drive up the number of ISIS sympathizers in the, in the Muslim population. This is a very concerted uh, strategy, and it is bearing, unfortunately, some fruit uh, given the indicators we're seeing in Europe right now. Thank you. Okay. Michael, Michel, the final uh, word. I think Paul already answered a lot of the question uh, you, you gave to me, and I'm very thankful for that, so I, I don't have to do that. Uh, I was pointing out in the beginning, and I, I think it's a terrible thing to speculate where could be the next uh, major attack, but I was speculating uh, on the background of the huge amount of fragility, also, also societal fragility when it comes to these terrorist uh, threats uh, that we actually see in Germany. And uh, to be at least a little bit provocative, I would even say, and I hope that Mr. Gomez is not <laughs> uh, correcting me on, on, on that, I thought that there was also in the German society for a long time the notion we can kind of either keep out or buy out ourselves, and we now have to see that is simply not possible. Uh, we, we can't do that. And uh, if we look at the logic of, let's say, terrorists saying, where can I get the, the deepest impact? And this is the logic of terrorists. I still think that there is a considerable amount of, of that threat uh, that we are actually facing uh, in, in, in Germany. Uh, why not using uh, the, the average citizens, uh, Mr. Gomez said before, what I also think that the so-called surveillance trauma in Germany is something that is uh, very, uh, very difficult. Uh, that is the history, the fact that we had the National Socialists and also the surveillance, the Stasi, state uh, in the GDR, that leads to the, the fact that we have maybe little compliance to surveillance. Surveillance, even though there is some, I think, legitimate discussion about the fact whether surveillance can really prevent attacks, uh, but I think there is a little compliance in, in, in Germany. Uh, but I think that is now slightly changing. With the growing amount of terror awareness, also this compliance to let's say the simple things like searches of, of handbags, uh, which still is something that is, uh, that is uh, I would say, something that is rejected sometimes in, in, in the German society. There is, though, a, a dilemma or a, a dichotomy, if, uh, if you would allow me to say that, between the cyber life, in which the Germans don't care uh, what kind of privacy they actually have, uh, and the, the daily life, so to say, where they care uh, there's too much surveillance and, and somebody's looking in my, in my bag. So this is something also I think we have to bring to the, to the public discussion that there's a, 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 a huge ambivalence uh, uh, actually. Uh, and the, the last thing I would uh, like to stress again, even though I did that in my presentation, I think in, in this using the, the average citizen, we have to pay attention to the issue of not letting something like Islam, Islamophobia happen, which is a, is a damn challenge, I, I, I have to say. That would be very complicated. But if we would do so, we would play the us and them game uh, that the ISIS uh, people actually want us to play. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, please help me thank uh, this wonderful panel. And uh, I'm happy to let you know that lunch is served uh, in the Sculpture Garden.